Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you all for joining today's webinar, Trends in Maternal and Child Nutrition in the MENA Region, Findings from Jordan, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. I'm Devin Andrews, the Communication Specialist for the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab, and I will be your MC today. As more attendees are joining the webinar, I will begin by going over some logistical items. Next slide, please. I would like to attend, direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom call. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Please use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation with other attendees. Next, please. If you have a question for one of the panelists, please use the Q&A feature. Panelists will respond to questions in the Q&A as they are able. We have allotted the final 20 minutes of this webinar for Q&A, at which point the panelists will respond to any remaining questions from the audience. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, send a message in the chat to panelists. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website following the session. Before I introduce today's moderator, I'll give a brief introduction to the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab and our webinar series. The Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab is supported by USAID and the Feed the Future Initiative. We pursue research and capacity building activities to support the health and nutrition of women and young children in Jordan. Some of our key objectives are implementing a rigorous maternal and child nutrition research agenda, including secondary analyses using existing nationally representative data sets, conducting a comprehensive evaluation of USAID's community health and nutrition program, and building individual and institutional capacity through fellowships, scientific symposia, workshops, and webinars. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Hala Nwaise, who will be the moderator for today's session. Dr. Hala is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Technology at the University of Jordan. Her main areas of research are nutritional epidemiology, the development of new dietary assessment methods, and the relationship between diet and chronic diseases. Her research has also focused on the diet, lifestyle, and metabolic determinants of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Hala, over to you. Hey, thank you, Devon. Uh... Welcome everyone to the second webinar organized by uh, Jordan in Nutrition uh, Innovation uh, Lab. Uh, today's webinar will focus on uh, trends in maternal and child nutrition in the MENA region, uh, finding from uh, Jordan, Kuwait, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, as we know that according to the World Health Organization, uh, the non-communicable uh, disease were responsible uh, about 74 percentage of all death in uh, the region with the prevalence of non-communicable disease and the rates of overweight and obesity uh, have been increasing among uh, uh, women at reproductive age and uh, youth. Uh, in addition to the consumption of sugar, sweet and beverage uh, and the uh, calorie dense uh, ultra processed food uh, also have been identified as a major contributor to total calorie consumed by women and youth. Based on that, in this webinar, the uh, panelists will present finding uh, on the current trends in maternal, infant, and young child uh, uh, in the MENA region, sharing case studies uh, uh, on the impacts of evidence-based policy uh, action on the sugar, sweet, and beverage sales and its overall uh, uh, consumption. Uh, another point that uh, today's webinar includes a, a, a list of uh, experts who work on uh, uh, maternal, uh, infant, and child nutrition health uh, and policy, and I would like to present all of the uh, uh, speaker before starting uh, uh, our webinar. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shibani. Uh, Dr. Shibani Goch uh, is a research associate professor of nutrition uh, science and uh, policy at Fredman School, uh, Tuft University. She is also the principal investigator of Jordan Nutrition Innovation uh, Lab and a, a director of uh, an associate director for the uh, Feed the Future Food uh, uh, System for a Nutrition Innovation uh, Lab. Uh, Dr. Shibani research interests in understanding the role of agriculture in improving nutrition while ensuring the uh, health and assessing the diet and non-diet determinants of nutritional status uh, among uh, infant and uh, children, in addition to uh, testing intervention aimed at uh, uh, 
improving the maternal and infant growth and uh, in nutrition. Uh, also, the next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Len Osman. Uh, Dr. Uh, Len is the Saqr bin Muhammad Al Qasimi, a professor in international uh, nutrition, and she is also the director of the Master of Nutrition uh, Science and Policy uh, program at the Fredman School, Taft University. Uh, she is also a fellow in the American Society of Nutrition and is a registered dietitian. Uh, Dr. Osman also is uh, trained as a nutritional uh, biochemist with teaching and research interest in chronic disease uh, and uh, in nutrition. Uh, last but surely not the least, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Reem uh, Sukait. Uh, Dr. Reem is an assistant professor at the Community uh, Health Department of King Saud University. She is also a health specialist at the World Bank's uh, Health and Nutrition and Population Practice based in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, Dr. Reem's research experience uh, lies at the intersection of uh, in nutrition, public health, and uh, policy, specifically uh, in the Middle uh, East. Uh, now I will give the speaking to uh, Dr. Shibani to uh, start with her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hala, for the very kind um, introduction um, and good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, today I am going to be talking about some of the analysis that the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab has conducted around assessing trends in infant and young child feeding practices. Uh, most of the data that we have utilized come from the demographic health surveys, uh, which have been collected uh, over the past 30 years, the, a nationally representative survey that has been conducted since for the past 30 years in Jordan. Next slide, please. So I think it's, uh, it's very critical to point out that irrespective of where we are in the world, um, there are two very critical points when it comes to early life uh, development. One is you need optimal uh, and appropriate nutrition, um, uh, nutrition and diet. And that is very related to feeding practices um, that a mother is likely to employ uh, with respect to the, the first two years of life. And what happens is if there's really poor nutrition during that first uh, part of life, it doesn't only affect the health and development, the immediate health and development, it is likely to cause irreversible damage uh, both to physical and cognitive um, uh, development of the child, but it also increases later on uh, risk of obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. And many of you are probably familiar of the literature that's emerging around the um, issues related to early life, uh, poor nutrition, and later life chronic disease. Next slide, please. Now, critical within the context of early life are the infant and young child feeding practices. And I just want to highlight a few that are very important um, to look at and consider when you're working with pediatric populations. One is, of course, uh, the, the status of breastfeeding. And when we're looking at status of breastfeeding, there are a couple of indicators. Uh, first is whether the mother initiates breastfeeding early. And when we say early initiation, that means within the first hour of birth. Uh, second is if there is exclusive breastfeeding where no um, nothing other than breast milk is provided for the first six months of life. And third is if the mother is able to continue breastfeeding until two years of age. So these are, have been identified by the World Health Organization as critical indicators of, um, of breastfeeding practice and that are very related to optimal health and development of the child. Um, the other two uh, areas to look at is uh, in terms of uh, the type of complementary foods that are provided after six months of age and the timely introduction of those complementary foods. So these all encompass uh, what we call as IYCF or infant and young child feeding practices. And all of this has to happen within a very short period of time. Many of you probably work with pediatric populations know that the first six to nine months of life is a very critical period of growth in where there's very rapid rapid growth happening. And therefore having really optimal practices starting at birth and going through 12 to 24 months of age uh, is very important. Next slide, please. So in the context of Jordan, there has been emerging literature around issues related to breastfeeding and breastfeeding practices and not having the environment for women to continue breastfeeding. There has been a little bit of literature highlighting um, issues related to dietary practices um, in early life. 
Um, but what we thought was it would be important to look at um, and assess using existing data, what are the trends and what have been the changes in breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices over time? Uh, because you know what we are seeing is snapshots of information in smaller studies. So we thought if we were able to harvest existing uh, nationally representative data, it would be interesting to understand what's going on. We also wanted to look at some specific uh, factors, social demographic factors um, that might be associated as well as geographic factors, whether it mattered whether you know a, a mother was in the north of Jordan or the south of Jordan had, was more urban versus rural and did those affect breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices. And lastly, uh, within the context of uh, modern day diets, what we are seeing is of course, because of depression and breastfeeding, you're seeing more consumption of breast milk substitutes, but you're also seeing a much earlier on introduction to sugar sweetened beverages, juices, fried foods, um, candies, and, and uh, sugary foods much, much earlier in life across many parts of the world. And so those might be competing with what we would call as a nutrient-dense diet. And in this case, we're looking at micronutrient-rich foods as a source of a nutrient-dense diet. Next slide, please. So just to briefly go over the study methods, as I've already mentioned, we harvested data from the demographic health surveys. And we, we have, there are six surveys that have been conducted since, the 19, since 1990 through 2017. And as I've already mentioned, these are nationally representative surveys that provide data on a wide range of monitoring and impact evaluation indicators within the areas of population health um, and nutrition. Um, information is collected on households, uh, on children under five years of age, and on men and women between the ages of 15 and 49 years. You also find um, data on the location characteristics or geographic characteristics, if you will, which is what governorate this data comes from. Is it a rural or urban household? What's the age of the child, the gender of the child? There's also anthropometric data, uh, both on the mother and the child, uh, education of the mother, as well as uh, many different variables that will allow us to compute um, socioeconomic status, which in this case, we use uh, the DHS Wealth Index. Um, in addition, uh, dietary recall data is collected on uh, uh, the children. And in the case for this study, we really focused on the infant, which is a child under two years of age. Um, next slide, please. So this is just to uh, uh, illustrate to you the number of uh, children under six months, the number of children under 24 months, and the children aged six to 23 months that were within each of these surveys. So if you look at the total, there are about 14,874 children that were surveyed over the six surveys, um, and it ranges anywhere from 1,600 to 4,000 um, children within that age group. So it's a fairly large sample size. We're not going, I'm not going into the sampling details. The DHS has a very comprehensive report that outlines how the sampling strategy and um, works and how they sample and what's the method of sampling. So I will not go into that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of uh, what we, just to continue on the study methods, um, we basically merged all this data into a single database and we reviewed for consistency. And given that these are data that are collected over time, so we have to make sure that the types of questions and the types of foods that are tracked are basically, we are able to combine them. So we have to review all the differences and develop any and develop standardized variables. So the critical part of this analysis is to make sure that you're not comparing apples to oranges, but that you are basically looking at all the data and generating um, variables that will allow you to compare apples to apples, if you will. So, and we also then following this, we can conduct uh, descriptive statistics, doing analysis of proportions, a lot of sort of understanding of, um, of the data using um, um, basic descriptive statistics. And then we've continued, con uh, once we had an under understanding of the patterns and the trends, we utilize logistic regression analyses to assess differences in the outcome variables across survey years by education, by geographic location, by wealth and age of the child um, um, amongst other variables. Next slide, please. So what were the outcome or the dependent variables? Because we were looking at both breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices, there are many, many different dependent variables. So I'm just gonna sort of give you a little bit of a, um, 
or overview of the outcome variables and, and wherever necessary, I'll give you the definitions. So we have breastfeeding indicators, which have already defined prior to six months of age, we, that we looked at were the percentage of children that were exclusively breastfed who were under six months, the percentage that were currently breastfed and the percentage and the, the rate of early initiation of breastfeeding. Uh, and this was all focused on only those kids that were under six months of age. Um, we also looked at the consumption of breast milk substitutes and other liquids in that same group. Uh, and we also looked at uh, the percentage of children that were consuming tea, juice, sugar, water, milk, infant formula um, during that period. Now, then we moved on to the kids who were six to 23 months of age, and we looked at the complementary feeding indicators that are first is minimum dietary diversity, the second is minimum meal frequency, and the third is minimum, minimum advocate diet. Diet, MAD, um, along with the consumption of specific foods and food groups in the past 24 hours. And I will come back to defining these three complementary feeding indicators just before I present um, the results on that. So, next slide, please. Let me just jump into what we saw in that uh, the cohort of children who were under six months of age across time. So what you're seeing in this graph is where we have plotted from 1990 to 2017, what were the breastfeeding practices in, in children who were younger than six months of age? Um, and in the, the blue line reflects the percentage that are exclusively breastfeeding at that given survey time point. The green is if they were currently breastfeeding and the red is the early initiation. And what you see is that in general, women do breast, continue to breastfeed. And we are looking only at the small subset. We're not looking at the entire group, but we're just looking at that six month age group. And we do find that women do continue breastfeeding in that age, but they're not exclusively breastfeeding and they are introducing other um, uh, foods and liquids. Um, what, uh, and this has been consistent over time. Over the past three decades, across all the surveys, the rates have been pretty consistent. Um, what you see in the dashed line are the trends line. So you're basically seeing a flat line, which means that nothing's really shifted. Um, what you are seeing is essentially there has been a shift in early initiation of breastfeeding, which is a really good sign because it's saying that there has been a push towards supporting women in starting breastfeeding within the first hour of birth. Um, what I want to point out is that at the end of the day, the median duration of exclusive breastfeeding in the total number of months before six months of age is still very low. It's about one month. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just to show you in contrast to the sort of breastfeeding practices is the consumption of breast milk substitutes and sugar sweetened beverages in children before six months of age. And here I just wanna highlight the, the blue line, which is essentially the consumption of formula or any kind of dairy milk um, uh, in children um, from 1990 to 2017 has increased significantly. It's basically children in 2017 were twice as likely to have been provided a breast milk substitute um, uh, than children in uh, 1990. Um, and the other liquids are not so, they don't seem to emerge as much. I also want to point out that not all the surveys collected data on all the liquids, um, but we do have, we were able to look at breast milk consumption and we were looking at specific breast milk substitutes such as formula and, and dairy milks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we looked at the factors, we looked at ge geography, we looked at wealth, we looked at education. And what I'm presenting here to you are the findings from that logistic regression. And what you see is there is a, there is a relationship with wealth where uh, the infants who are in higher wealth quintile households were more likely to be given formulas. Um, in terms of urban households, more than formula, it seemed to be dairy milk. And this is irrespective of survey year. We have control for survey year in this. But what we didn't find was any difference in practices or provision of breast milk substitute either by governorate or by the educational attainment of the mother uh, for this young uh, group. That is, so it seems to be consistently um, constant across governorates and across the mother's education level. Next slide, please. 
Um, so bef I just want to go through a few of the complementary feeding uh, indicator findings. And just before I go in, I just want to put some definitions out there because there could be dif different definitions. I just want to highlight what we used. For minimum dietary diversity, we assessed if the child had consumed five or more out of eight food groups. And we did include breast milk as one of the food groups because that is what is recommended by FAO in the current definition of minimum diet diversity. Um, minimum meal frequency was basically the number of times a child receives a meal or a snack or a mil milk field in milk feed, excuse me, in the previous 24 hours. Uh, and that varies depending upon the age of the child. And that varies whether the child is breastfed or not breastfed. And I don't, I'm not putting the details here because of keeping track of time, but we do have a report that we will be happy to share with that provides details. And the last thing is the minimum acceptable diet. Now, this is a composite indicator of diet diversity and meal frequency. And essentially, what you're seeing is that you need to have the diversity in the diet, but you also have to have the frequency. And that, in combination, becomes an acceptable diet. Um, and so this is a combination of the first two indicators. Uh, next slide, please. Now, before I talk about this particular slide, I want to point out to the fact that um, we were able to compute. So first of all, not all, all years had the data that allowed us to compute these indicators. We were able to do it from 2002 onwards. Um, and based on different definitions, um, and we were able to compute the MAD only for 2012 and 2017. But we were able to assess the trends over time. And what you basically see is that there is a pretty significant issue with respect to minimum meal frequency as well as minimum diet diversity uh, over time. And particularly with the meal frequency, it's the children who are slightly older, 18 to 23 months of age, that were not being fed the minimum number of meals. In case of the minimum diet diversity, it's actually the younger children who are not being exposed to a diverse diet or the minimum diet diversity diversity in diet that would be needed. Um, and, and subsequently, it's the same thing. It's the minimum acceptable diet seems to be the, the, the lowest among the youngest age group, which is about the six to six to eight, nine month age group is what we're looking at. Again, that's the period of very critical growth where you're trying to shift the child into starting to eat semi-solid and solid food. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really hard for those of you who work in pediatrics, probably understand how hard it is to get and how, how, it, how hard it is for mothers to actually get the infant to eat at that age. So, so, so that's a critical point to, uh, to highlight. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of, again, factors associated with these practices, irrespective of survey year, we did find significant education uh, differences by education level. So the mother was more educated. She was more likely to achieve the three indicators. In terms of the governorates, not that many differences, that, but we did find in Irbid and Mafra that the infants were more likely to achieve their minimum advocate diet um, uh, than compared to the infants in Amman. Um, again, wealth seems to be consistently um, uh, related with higher the wealth, higher the odds of achieving indicators. So in our, in our regressions, what we generally seem to find is education and wealth seem to matter more than geographic location, though you do see patterns here and there with respect to some of the governorates. Next slide, please. Um, and here, what you're looking at, and I'm just going to quickly go through this because I know I'm pretty much out of time. Um, what you see here is a consumption of micronutrient rich foods uh, from the age of six to 23 months, uh, or, uh, because we took the, the, the complementary feeding data and we broke it down by food groups. And what you find is that very few children are consuming dark green leafy vegetables. Um, and if you look at the top of the, the graph, what you're seeing is a lot of consumption of animal source foods, but most of it is dairy milk. Uh, and what you're seeing, and I'm not presenting the data on eggs, meat, fish, and poultry, but we are seeing a decline over time. So it seems to me that while there is animal source food consumption as an overall group, most of it is coming from um, dairy milk, and there's a decline in eggs, meat, fish, and poultry consumption. Um, at the bottom of the, the, the graph, you can see a lot of the sort of vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables and legumes um, and dark green leafy vegetables are on the lower end um, of the graph. Next slide, please. Um, in contrast, the 
consumption of breast milk substitutes and sugar sweetened beverages has gone up. There has been a significant increase um, in consumption of these, particularly of juice from 1990 to 2017. And so similar to what we are seeing in the young age group, which is under six month olds, you're seeing consumption of infant formula increasing over time uh, as well. And it's, it's particularly, particularly high in younger infants, those under 12 months. Um, next slide, please. Um, again, bottom line is education and wealth of the household did matter even with the food group consumptions. What's very interesting to point out here is that while there was increasing consumption of infant formula, dairy milks and juices as education and wealth increased, in, in, we also found that women who were more educated or came from more healthier households were also providing vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables and some specific animal source foods, including eggs, meat, fish, and poultry to their infants. So there's a dichotomy here that they're using, um, you know, breast milk substitutes and sugar sweetened beverages, but they're also providing uh, more nutrient dense foods um, through, through the diet. There are some differences by the government at level and um, they're not sort of very striking differences, but there are some differences with respect to consumption of uh, nutrient dense uh, fruits and vegetables. Next slide, please. So there are some caveats that I want to point out to this. We try to start, we have standardized the data as much as possible, but as you have noted, not all data collected across all the years. So we don't have a complete picture of the consumption patterns. Um, and what was very important as we are seeing this, I don't think we have a very detailed uh, um, information on the type of sugar sweetened beverages other than the juices. So I'm pretty sure we are missing uh, sodas and we're missing um, other sugar sweetened beverages. And we're also missing a lot of the ultra processed foods. And that's not surprising because the data that were collected by the DHS were focused on trying to understand the micronutrient advocacy of the diet. Um, so that's something um, to highlight. Um, so next slide, please. So what we decided to do was um, we wanted to look at um, data that will allow us to understand what is the household doing then in terms of these ultra processed foods and sugar sweetened beverages. So we were able to, um, thanks to the Department of Statistics, utilize data from four rounds of the household expenditure and income survey um, and, and look at a subsample of those households. Uh, and the surveys, are, and I'm, I'm not going into detail on the survey because this is ongoing work. We're still trying to tease this out um, from, uh, but the data were collected from 2002 to 2013. Um, next slide, please. And we looked at households that uh, um, with children under two within the subset. And uh, what you see is that there is a, um, on the top of the bar, you see is the, percent, the percentage of the expenditure of um, on ultra processed foods. Um, and you see that sweet and savory foods, most of these households are spending on buying a lot of ultra processed foods. And we have different definitions for sweet and different definitions for savory. But you're also seeing uh, an increase and then a little di dip in the consumption or the expenditure around juice and sodas. Uh, but when you look at a trend perspective, it's actually pretty flatline. So a lot of the, the food budget is going towards the, the consumption and expenditure on ultra processed foods. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we looked at the, uh, we utilize what is called as the NOVA classification to take all the food items that they have spent on and divide them into these four groups, which is the unprocessed or minimally processed foods, processed ingredients, processed foods like canned fish and fruits and syrup, and then we what we call as the ultra processed foods, in which, what, which means basically soft drinks, sweets, or savory packaged snacks. Um, etc. So that was defined as ultra processed foods. Now I want to caveat here and say that there are different classifications out there. We just happen to use the NOVA classification as a way to guide our analysis. Um, next slide, please. And what I want to point out here is that we took the minimal, minimally processed foods and divided them into minimally processed fruits and vegetables and minimally processed sort of cereals and staples. And what I want you to look at is the orange line. That is the percentage of the food budget that is spent on fruits and vegetables. And that is lower, considerably lower than that which is spent on ultra processed foods. And this is across time. It's a very flat line. So you can see that it doesn't matter whether it's 2002 versus 2014. There seems to be a very very flat line and a lot more expenditure on ultra processed foods. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we looked at the expenditure on fruits and vegetables in a, in a linear regression, and we looked at the kind of percentage of food uh, budget that is spent on those food groups, and I want you to look at the last 
uh, row, which is Nova Food Group 4, which is the ultra processed foods. And you find that households that spend on uh, the Nova uh, fourth food group, which is ultra processed foods, was significantly less likely to spend, uh, and this is in JDs per capita, on fruits and vegetables. So there is a, uh, there is a distinction um, in, um, um, in, um, in those households that are consuming ultra processed foods, and there might be some displacement of uh, micronutrient rich um, uh, foods, particularly uh, fruits and vegetables. So again, as I said, this is work going on in progress, and we just wanted to highlight some of the interesting findings that we are seeing from the household income and expenditure data. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, what we are seeing is that there is an increasing trend in consumption of breast milk substitutes, as well as sugar sweetened beverages. Of course, there are improvements in the early initiation of breastfeeding, which is really, really laudable and really important uh, movement, but we are seeing um, little improvement in the other indicators. Uh, what was very interesting in this, particular re uh, in this particular analysis was that we are complementary feeding indicators were not significantly different across geographic location or area of, dif uh, area of residence, but there were differences by education and wealth of the mother. Um, and we do need more in-depth dietary data to enumerate the dietary patterns within this age group, but we are seeing a more, we are seeing a subtle shift towards more ultra processed food consumption. Um, next, please. Um, and so as I, I think the expenditure data is allowing us to understand a little bit better on how households are choosing or purchasing or spending on ultra processed foods. But we, we need to disaggregate and look at the households with children under two a little bit more within that data set. And I just wanna end by saying that this is all really, really important um, because of the fact that we know that, there are, that the overweight and obesity rates in young children are, are, is increasing. Um, in Jordan. And, and that's sort of a pretty critical concern when you're looking at the perspective of being introduced to really, um, you know, poor nutrient dense diets so early on in life. So thank you so much. And I apologize to Dr. Hala for going so over time, but I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Lin, who's going to yes. uh, take on the next. Thank week. you, Dr. Shibani. Thank you, Shibani. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Today, I'd like to first talk about a really important study that one of our graduate students at Tufts, uh, Badria Alahu, who is now Dr. Alahu at the Kuwaiti Institute for Scientific Research. She carried this out and was published in 2020. The results from adult Kuwaitis in terms of diet, and then compare these to uh, local results in Jordan. And then finally, like, why do we care? What, what does this mean for us? Next slide, please. Adult Kuwaitis are experiencing a very rapid rise in cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. But nobody yet in Kuwait had adequately examined the dietary patterns um, of these individuals. So in 2008 and 2009, there was a national nutrition survey in Kuwait in which 24-hour food intakes um, were carried out. And Badria did a cross-sectional uh, survey from these data from 559 adult Kuwaitis to see exactly what they were consuming. Individuals that had diagnosed heart disease and diabetes, that is diagnosed, were omitted from the sample to avoid the problem of reverse causation. And the outcome measures that she used were body mass index, waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, dyslipidemia in terms of blood lipid levels and glucose and glycosylated hemoglobin. In terms of the statistical analysis, the dietary patterns uh, were compared using principal component analysis and then the association between these dietary patterns and their risk factors were evaluated using survey-weighted multivariable linear and logistic regression models. Next slide, please. Here are the characteristics of the 555 um, adult Kuwaitis. The average age was uh, about 34. The average body mass index was 29. 
a little over half were females and about 45% at least had some college. The uh, majority of the individuals were not smokers, but the majority definitely were sedentary. And over 67% of these individuals were overweight or had obesity. Next slide, please. Now the foods or the food groups that Badria used are in this slide here, and I certainly can't read you, um, you know, through the entire list, but you'll recognize that they're the standard food groups that people use when they look at dietary patterns. Next slide, please. And Badria found three major dietary patterns. First of all, there was a vegetable rich dietary pattern loaded high with vegetables, except for potatoes with, that were put into the fast food group. The second pattern was a fast food dietary pattern that was loaded high with burgers and sandwiches, French fries and sugar sweetened beverages. And the third dietary pattern in this group was a refined grains poultry dietary pattern that was loaded high in refined grains and poultry and low in whole grains. So those are the three patterns. Next slide. Now, what results did she find? Now, within each of the dietary patterns, she um, put the data into three turtiles. And then you can compare the people who are following the pattern most stringently, which would be the third turtile. You can compare that to the first. So for the vegetable rich dietary pattern, these individuals were older and more likely to be women and they were non-smokers. And there were no differences in odds ratios of the various uh, outcomes we looked at in comparing the first to the third turtile. However, in the fast food rich dietary pattern, these individuals were younger, they were more likely to be women and more likely to having received higher levels of education. And in comparing the third to the first dietary pattern, you find that the odds ratios of being obese or having a high blood pressure or metabolic syndrome were anywhere from two to two and a half of the, the ones following it the most as compared to slightly less. And she was able to also compute that for every change in one standard deviation in the odds ratio, you, how much of an increase you would seen, see in the diastolic blood pressure, increase in body mass index, and increase in waist circumference. For the third dietary pattern, which was the refined grains and poultry pattern, the highest scores were more likely to be um, younger individuals. And in this case, the odds ratios of the third to the first turtile showed odds ratios of two for dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome. Next slide, please. So what are the conclusions here for reproductive women for Kuwait? First of all, the younger adults are more likely to be women of reproductive age, and they are adopting a more Western fast food type dietary pattern. This is associated with significant CVD risk factors of metabolic syndrome, overweight, obesity, and elevated blood pressure. The refined green poultry dietary pattern is associated with higher fasting glucose and glycosylated hemoglobin, which is also reflected in the higher prevalence of prediabetes and diabetes in the general Kuwaiti population. And finally, the vegetable rich dietary pattern, which is followed by the older Kuwaitis, and they are more likely to be women, were not linked to any CVD risk outcomes. Next slide. Now, in, there are many examples in Jordan of people doing excellent work on uh, food intake, dietary patterns, and I'd like to have a, show a couple of examples here to see how does this compare to what was found in Kuwait. So Alawad and colleagues looked at 540 students at Hashemite University and found 
36% overweight and 30 and 15% were hookah and cigarette smokers. And that the majority consume fruits and vegetables only one to two times per week. And cereals, grains, and starchy vegetables five times per week. So clearly this is not an ideal pattern. Next slide. And here are two examples from hospital clinics. Bustami and colleagues looked at Jordan University Hospital Clinics, uh, individuals 428 who at least 18 years of age are reported to the clinics, found that 71% were overweight or obese. And this was related to high parity and low education level. And interestingly, the obesity rate increased after the age of 30. And Tayyim and colleagues uh, did a study on pregnant Jordanian women. And they looked at 283 women uh, who came to maternity clinics at the hospital. And they, these individuals were given food frequencies in the first, second, and third trimester, different individuals at each time. 38% of these individuals were overweight and obese and greater than 70% of them had a diploma. Now it is interesting that the, um, and they compared from the food frequencies, they compared this to recommended servings of foods in five major groups, um, according to the American Dietary Guidelines for pregnant women. So they found that for grains, individuals consuming two to three servings more grains than recommended, at most periods, they were cons consuming 14 servings per day of fats, which was way higher than recommended and was unhealthy. And a high percentage of the individuals were not meeting the dietary guidelines for some of the more important food groups, including fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and various protein um, sources. So overall, the uh, diet of these pregnant Jordanian women um, mirrored what we saw also in Kuwait. Next slide, please. Now there's, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a new, I will call it syndrome, um, that we have been following and is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and this is prevalent in 20 to 30% of the general population worldwide. Now, in the little inset, the, um, when the liver has more than 5% fat, it is called steatosis. And that this is reversible. You can uh, change your diet, lose weight, and the fat will decrease. But in 10 to 20% of individuals with steatosis, it will progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which in some individuals can go to fibrosis or cirrhosis or liver cancer. So this is a very serious problem. This is independent of other risk factors of cardiovascular disease. So for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we use the term NAFELD, the prevalence in type 2 diabetics is 76%. The prevalence in adults that have obesity is 80, 90%. And in patients with hyperlipidemia is 90%. And we also know that metabolic syndrome, as I've been discussing um, in the individuals in both Kuwait and Jordan, is associated with NAFELD, central obesity, elevated blood pressure, dyslipidemia, uh, hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. And most importantly, NAFELD is associated with the diet with excess refined carbohydrates and fat intake. Next slide, please. Tayum and colleagues actually did a case control study of adults, um, of Jordanian adults 30 to 60 years of age. And they selected 60 patients with NAFELD and 60 controls. And for this, they use ultrasonography to identify the degree of fat uh, within the liver. In the patients, they had significantly higher body mass index, waist circumference and weight, significantly less physical activity, and significantly higher macronutrient intakes. 
So none of this should be surprising, but it is documented how important this is. Next slide. What do we know about pregnancy in NAFELD? Pregnant women with NAFELD or any impaired liver function tests, and there are several, have a higher risk of preterm birth and that pregnant women with NAFELD have significantly increased relative risk for pregnancy outcomes like gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, cesarean section, preterm birth, and low birth weight. So this is a risk both for the mother as well as for the fetus and the newborn. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Cantorell and colleagues did something called a structural equation model for maternal and child overweight obesity to see how they are associated with liver fat contents. Now it's a, it's a busy slide, but they factored in pre-pregnancy, overweight and obesity, whether the mother is overweight or obese at delivery, what happened to the child at four years, adolescent, young adulthood, the mother's age and schooling, first pregnancy, did they breastfeed, uh, energy, and alcohol intake and smoking. And they could determine which of the factors seemed to be predictive for an elevated liver fat content. So the maternal overweight and obesity is significantly associated with the odds of infant and child overweight at delivery, at four years, adolescence, and young adulthood. And all of these are associated with increased liver fat. Next slide, please. So what are the conclusions regarding women for reproductive age? Poor nutrition during pregnancy is high energy intake, saturated and trans fat, refined carbohydrates and sodium, increase the risk of the mother for NAFELD and metabolic syndrome, they increase the risk for gestational diabetes. They increase the risk for excessive weight gain during pregnancy, which leads to high infant birth weight and childhood obesity. Preterm delivery, low birth weight, small for gestational age, that is increased for risk of children being overweight and obese at three years of age. These are all negative factors that affect both the mother the mother during pregnancy, and the child. Um, but most importantly, and I think as uh, Shabani pointed out, there's also now evidence that exclusive breastfeeding for at least six months of age without any supplements at all appears productive for fatty liver in adolescence. Um, thank you very much. And I think now we'll um, and oh, these are my references. And I'll now turn this over to um, Reem. Thanks a lot, uh, Lynn. I highly appreciate it. And it's wonderful to be with you all today. And um, I actually did my master's and PhD at Tufts. So it's uh, wonderful to be back even virtually. Okay, great. So uh, the topic of our uh, last talk today is the role of the fiscal policies in improving nutrition, basically monetary policies, think of uh, taxation and subsidies, uh, and how can we use these tools to improve nutritional status. So we'll be presenting a case study on sugar sweetened beverage taxations uh, from Saudi Arabia, which was actually part of my uh, dissertation work. Next slide, please. So it's, this is probably not surprising, but as we all know, obesity uh, overall has been increasing. Uh, and I would say that the trend in increase in the GCC countries specifically has been um, uh, higher uh, than other contexts. Next slide, please. So, and a lot of this is being driven uh, by diet related diseases. So if you look at the figure on the right side, you can see that almost the top four um, uh, largest contributing risk factors to NCDs are in one way or another diet related. So we have high BMI, dietary risks, um, high uh, fasting glucose, and high blood pressure. 
And it's not surprising when we look at the dietary pattern of uh, Saudi residents. Uh, and I would say a lot of this is, is similar across the region. So for example, only 8% meet the fruit and vegetable recommendations. And uh, back in 2016, Saudis were actually the fifth largest consumers of calories from sugar sweetened beverages, which um, Shivani touched upon at the beginning of the, uh, of the first presentation. Next slide, please. And why, why is this? The, why is this there is so uh, hyper focus on sugar sweetened beverages? Well, let's start with the definition. So we define them as liquids that are sweetened with various forms of added sugar. So it's not just your uh, soda or soft drinks. It also includes all any any think of it as any liquid with added sugar. And there was actually a really interesting study by uh, Hiba Bawadi, I think from uh, Qatar University, along with colleagues that was recently published on uh, Jordanian adolescents, and they found that um, actually, the largest uh, contributing uh, uh, sugary beverages in their diet was not soft drinks. It was actually sweetened uh, coffee and juices, which I'll, I'll get back to um, at the end of the presentation. And not just that, it was actually adding about 480 calories per day to these uh, adolescents' diet. So it, it, the, the contribution of sugar sweetened beverages is really high in terms of calorie load to diets. And also, we also know that it is there's a reason why there's a hyper focus on sugar sweetened beverages, which is that there is associated with several NCDs. So for example, we know that consuming sugar sweetened beverages would lead to weight gain. And this was based on a systematic review and I, will, I can share the references later. And that's regardless of your overall diet, regardless of whether you exercise or not. So just one factor of your dietary habits, which is consuming sugar sweetened beverages would lead to weight gain. Similarly with type two diabetes, we know that um, one extra serving of sugar sweetened beverages a day would increase your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by about 13%. And lastly, with cardiovascular diseases, which is the number one um, um, cause of death globally, um, it, we know that uh, consuming one serving of sugar sweetened beverages a day would increase your risk of cardiovascular diseases by 17%. So think of this as we think about the high prevalence of these beverages in our communities and how uh, why we need to uh, take action to reduce them. Um, next slide, please. So it's not surprising with that context and how much we now know about how harmful the effect of these beverages are that there's a sort of a global movement towards taxing uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Some refer to it as the new tobacco uh, uh, because of the historical context with uh, tobacco and public health. So um, I, today, until today, at least 45 countries around the world have introduced one form or the, or the other of a sugary drink taxation. As you can see in the Middle East, we have um, most of the GCC countries except Kuwait. Um, and uh, I, I, I hear, I continuously hear about other countries in the region, whether it's um, uh, Egypt or other who are also interested in uh, implementing sugary drink taxations. Um, obviously not all of these taxes are the same. They say the devil is in the details, which I think is true. So a lot of the health impact, a lot of the economic impact depends on what kind of tax structure do you design? Do you tax, uh, for example, do you tax 10% or do you tax more than that? And then how do you implement that tax? And I'll uh, get into more details as we go on through the presentation. But this just gives you an overview that is something that, and this is, we're talking about 2014, I believe the first country was Mexico, which introduced sugar sweetened beverage taxation, and then it kind of exploded all over the world with a lot of countries introducing these forms of taxes. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, for, in Saudi Arabia, the tax was implemented. It was the largest tax uh, to date. Uh, it still is. So it's about, uh, it was implemented in 2017, and it's about 50% uh, rate on carbonated beverages on 100% on energy drinks. So as you can see, carbonated beverages is not exactly sugary drinks. So they, there's a lot of, there was a lot of uh, uh, back and forth in terms of uh, for, that, that we captured through our policy analysis uh, that shows why this, this definition uh, was kind of uh, uh, not very accurate. And uh, since then, in 2019, uh, because we're, again, we're targeting sugar, we're not targeting carbonation as, as, a, as, a, as a problem. So in 2019, uh, the tax was expanded to include all sugar sweetened beverages, including fruit juice and others. In terms of the tax design itself, as I mentioned, it's all it's the devil is in the details. So in, in, in the Saudi context, it's an excise tax, which is great. What do we mean by excise tax? It means that you can see it on the shelf. So if you go to the supermarket, you can see the price reflecting the tax. Whereas if it was a sales tax, then you wouldn't see it on the shelf. You would see it once you go to check out at the register. And how many of us actually looks at the receipt and go buy by one and compare that at the prices? So in a way, uh, the excise tax has been proven to be more effective in terms of a behavior change perspective. 
It's also a flat rate and it's based on the price. So that's something that we can negotiate whether to how we can approve. So basically, it, no matter what amount of sugar is in your product, whether it's five grams, whether it's 20 grams, you're, you're taxed the same rate. And that rate is 50% based on the price. And it's a flat rate. And we'll talk later on about potential uh, changes in that structure. Um, next slide, please. So our specific research questions for this uh, for today's talk was, well, did the tax actually, so it's introduced, did it actually lead to increase in prices? And whether that, and you can see on the right, the logical framework basically, or how we're thinking about why would the tax result in improvement in NCDs? And the logic behind it is once you have a tax, then the prices would increase. And then once the prices increase, people will consume less. And once that happens, then we would uh, be able to reduce NCDs. Obviously, each step of this logical framework needs proof that this actually happened. I can give you examples where um, uh, in countries, for example, they wouldn't necessarily pass on uh, the price increase or the tax to the consumers. They wouldn't want to raise the prices so much because they don't want it to affect their sales. So what they would do they would um, absorb some of the uh, some of that cost. So in that case, the tax the price didn't really increase. Then we shouldn't expect uh, to have changes in sales. So we need to verify that the prices did indeed increase. The next step on that uh, just, uh, logical framework is basically did that increase in prices actually affect sales? Did it have an impact on it or not? And then uh, we'll, I'll touch briefly just for the sake of time on potential health impact of the tax based on a modeling study that we did. Next slide, please. So to answer the question on did uh, the tax increase prices, we used uh, Saudi Arabia's General Authority of Statistics data set. So they used this to calculate the household uh, consumer price index. And uh, the type of data that was available was monthly prices of different commodities, uh, water, soft drinks, juices, even cigarettes, uh, across 16 cities from uh, across different regions. And it was monthly prices from 2009 to until today, and they continue publishing this. So, so this gave us kind of a nice longitudinal uh, data so we can see whether prices did actually increase or not. And for this, um, in terms of statistical, statistical analysis, we simply did a pre-post um, study um, uh, here to show um, the changes in prices. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see here in this figure, um, these are the monthly uh, beverage prices, and you can see that uh, in red, that's the carbonated drinks, and you can see that prices did increase uh, from one, it was 1.5 Saudi Rial before taxation, and it went up to about 2.3, now it's actually 2.5. Um, so it increased by about 67%. Uh, and what you can see in this figure, which was really nice, is that the increase in the tax happened exactly when the tax was introduced. Um, in 2017. So we can, to an extent, even though it's a, um, a, a cross-sectional study, so we can't imply causation, it does nicely show that when we expect an increase, there was an increase. In case you're wondering what happened after 2018, that was the, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, that was the 5% VAT, value added tax, which was introduced. And as you can see, all of the other beverages also increased. So that, that kind of gives us also validity to the data. We see what we expect to see based on what is known about the economy and what kind of price changes are happening. So remember the first question, did the prices increase? Yes, we can verify that the prices did indeed increase. So now let's look at um, sales. But um, I, I, I would be curious if you can type in the chat real quick whether you, you, th you think it had an impact um, on, on, on consumption or not. If you could type in yes or no or a number, what percentage you think? Uh, and uh, before I move on to, uh, to, to the next uh, slide. Okay, so we can see that some people are saying, uh, um, oh, okay, uh, so there's a divide. Oh, interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to show you the results. Um, can we move on? And if you can add percentages, that would be great also. How much, if those who say yes, how much do you think it changed? 15%, okay. So can we move on to the next slide, please? Great. So um, we, to answer whether the sales did decline or not, we used Euromonitor, Monitor, which, which is an international marketing company. They collect uh, annual volume sales uh, per category of food item from across uh, about 54 countries. So luckily, I was able to see data for Saudi Arabia and some of the countries in the GCC from 2007, 2007 up until today. So these are annual data, uh, volume sales per capita for different beverage categories. So we can see sales. In terms of statistical analysis, we also looked at pre-post, but we also wanted to add more rigor to that to the analysis. So we used the difference in difference um, regression in which we um, used Saudi Arabia as the kind of the treatment group or the intervention group. And then we used other GCC countries as the control group. 
and I'll, I'll show you results from both types of analysis. Next slide, please. So for those of you who said no, uh, I'm happy to report that they did indeed have an impact. So you can see uh, in this figure, these are the annual beverage sales per capita in Saudi Arabia during this period from 2010 to 2018. And you can see that bottled water, which is the top item, was fairly consistent. You can see energy drinks declined very um, uh, uh, rapidly, about 58%. And again, how do we define pre and post? I defined it uh, as the period of 2016, which is before the tax, and then um, after the tax was 17 and 18 uh, average. So we can say that, yes, it, um, uh, carbonated, and you can see for carbonate drinks, it was fairly, uh, the, which is the red line, it was fairly uh, consistent until the tax was introduced and then declined. So it's about 41% for carbonated drinks and 58% for energy drinks. So I was very excited about the results, went to a conference to present it, and I got a lot of pushback, which I'm sure you, you're probably thinking the same, which is, if you look at energy drinks, they've been declining for a while. So we can't really, around since 2014. So we can't really say or attribute that the causation is the tax because of this already trend in, of declining. So um, as a, so um, as a next step and to strengthen the analysis, as I mentioned, we compared to the GCC and we excluded energy drinks because there was a lot of uh, things happening with energy drinks. There was uh, campaigns to ban it and a lot of restrictions before the tax was even introduced. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So when we did focus on only carbonated drinks and we compared uh, Saudi Arabia to GCC countries to control for all of the different variables, whether it's the um, whether it's um, a sudden uh, uh, an increase in awareness, whether it's change in lifestyle, whether there's a weather consideration. To, to account for all of these um, factors, we decided to compare Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries. And as you can see here, which is a much more rigorous analysis, as you can see here, uh, we can see Qatar at the top, uh, Saudi Arabia in green, and then uh, Oman and Kuwait. And why did we select these three? Because they had data in the, in, the, in, in the Euro monitor, and they didn't, at the time, they didn't introduce taxes. Now all of them introduced taxes. So as you can see, it's very clear that something different happened in Saudi Arabia in 2017 compared to the other countries. And when we estimated uh, what, what does that mean in numeric terms, we found significant decline of about 35% of sales um, uh, uh, in comparison to GCC countries. So it's not, I think the, uh, from the chat, I could see the largest was I think 15%, so, uh, uh, or maybe 40. So we're, we're almost uh, there. Um, can we, so now we answered the second question, which is, did it have an, uh, did, did the increase in prices affect sales? And we can say uh, it, it definitely did affect uh, sales. Um, next slide, please. So the third question was we wanted to know, okay, what does this mean? Uh, so even if the sales decline, what would this mean in terms of a health impact on the population? And uh, we wanted to, to, to do it, obviously, to see actual um, uh, health outcomes would take many years to come and a lot of measurement. So another substitute, we wanted to model the impact and models, uh, you can love them and you can hate them. They can come with a lot of, um, they, they give us good estimates, but, uh, but there's a lot of um, uh, data requirements that are needed for it, but it gives us a sense of the direction of the impact or the health impact. So the purpose of this re third research question was what, what is uh, uh, the health impact on diabetes and cardiovascular diseases? And we defined the outcome was we wanted to know the number of deaths that would be prevented because of the tax and the number of disability adjusted life years or valleys that would be prevented. And we do we used a lot of data sources to be able to do this. And at the statistical analysis was a comparative risk assessment. I, I chose just for the sake of time, I didn't wanna um, get into the, all the modeling uh, details, but I'm happy to chat more if you want later on. But basically we took all of these assumptions and data sets and the impact that we saw from research, uh, from the question, the previous research question, and we modeled it to see, okay, what does this mean? What can we expect as a health impact. Can you go to the next slide? And just as a summary, we sh our model showed, and we also did sensitivity analysis uh, around the estimates, and it showed that they would the tax would prevent around 8,000 disability adjusted life years, so it would reduce it by 26%. And remember, this is from one risk factors, not changing the whole diet, nothing, nothing um, it's just reducing sugar sweet and beverage consumption through taxation. And we also estimated that the tax would prevent a total of 287 deaths uh, annually, which would be about a 35% reduction compared to if we didn't have the tax and now we have the tax. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, a, a, and these are obviously um, a, a modeling estimates, so, uh, but, but, based, but, but based on really solid data. And this is what we expect to see. So this helped us a lot also in terms of um, uh, discussing 
uh, the value or push because there's a lot of pushback against sugar sweetened beverage taxations from industry or from um, different sectors. So uh, this gave us kind of a, a, a proof of concept or showing that it does have a health positive health impact. Um, next slide. And I'm at time. Uh, so in, in, in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight that they did indeed increase prices and they did decrease sales uh, until today people question whether it had an impact so it did have an impact uh, there's there's I mentioned that the, ta the devil is in the details of the tax design so um, there's a lot of research that has has since uh, come up about which shows that having a tiered structure instead of flat design would actually lead to even more health benefits because it's a win, win situation so for example instead of everyone being taxed 50 percent if you reduce sugar and sugar content in your beverage I'm going to tax you less, I'm going to tax you 10%. So if you do that, then A, you're reducing consumption directly, and B, you're incentivizing or helping industry reduce their sugar content, which is going to benefit everyone. So it's it, it has a more, um, it's more beneficial as a policy. And there are considerations uh, now within Saudi Arabia to change the structure from a flat to tiered structure. Uh, I, I think it's interesting. It's also important to say that uh, fiscal policies are definitely a promising tool, but we need to be very careful in terms of uh, estimating, for example, impact on different income groups, uh, estimating also whether they, they have the impact that we want or is it uh, diluted somehow. So, But there, they, there's a lot of interesting work that can be done with fiscal policies, such as, uh, for example, not necessarily taxes, but fruit and vegetable subsidies and other kind of work, but we need data to show whether it works uh, and has an impact or not. Uh, there's also a push towards uh, having unified policies, which I'm sure many of you heard about nutrition labels and having warning labels and other kinds of labels. So another future direction could be what would happen if we combine a tax, because it kind of tells people, be careful, don't consume this, with a label uh, uh, as well. And what would, what would the impact of that be on consumer education and consumer behaviors in general? And obviously, future. this was just one study and one step. There's a lot more that can and should be done. Uh, for example, we need to consider substitution. So um, I mentioned the Jordanian study that showed most of the sugar comes from um, sweetened coffees. I would assume that is also the case in Saudi Arabia. I haven't seen a data to show it, but we didn't see an increase in water, uh, which is what happened in other countries. So water didn't increase in Saudi Arabia, sugar, uh, carbonated drinks decrease. So what are people consuming? And uh, I, 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 my non-scientific opinion would be uh, potential a lot of uh, Spanish lattes and a lot of these really sugary lattes. So uh, future studies should definitely consider such substitutions and how to introduce regulations to other beverages and also long-term effects. There's a lot of research that says people get used to taxes or get used to higher prices and kind of go back to their normal um, uh, consumption rates before taxation. So it's important to monitor long-term progress and whether that decline, that 35% decline, is consistent um, across the years. Um, that's all on my end. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I guess we can move to questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shibani, Dr. Len, and Dr. Rareem for amazing presentation and amazing uh, finding. Uh, now uh, we need to move uh, to the Q&A uh, uh, part. Uh, I think uh, that I have a question for uh, Dr. Shibani. Uh, they ask about uh, to, they ask to uh, about knowing more about the rising uh, trends over time of the early in introduction of the uh, before maternal uh, uh, surgery and can this be related to the factor beyond uh, the household education income and so linked with the other uh, uh, broader community environments and uh, uh, the implementation of the code of the P4 maternal surgery in the Jordan and it is a, a violation. I think this one uh, for Dr. Shivani. Yeah, thank you. And I, I feel like there are a lot more people who are in our list of attendees who are better equipped to answer this question. But let me take a stab at this. I think what what is happening, and this is where, um, you know, programs like CHN are focusing on supporting um, from the facility to the community actions that will support the mother in true making better choices. And for us, the better choice is to, to um, start breastfeeding and continue breastfeeding um, with an exclusive period um, uh, up to six months. And I think that 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 it's a combination of um, very easy, accessible, and available breast milk substitutes, 
it's a combination of uh, the fact that there's been research that's shown um, in different parts of Jordan that women in the workforce um, uh, ha don't have an enabling environment to continue breastfeeding. Um, so, so there's a. I think it's not just one particular reason um, that you're seeing the shift in uh, consumption of breast milk substitutes. It's a multiple reason. So yes, to some extent, there is a community environment factor um, that is affecting uh, the women's choices. And and I think the education and income are kind of linked to women's opportunities um, and women's being in the workplace as well. So there's a little bit of a, a connection over there. So sorry, I'm giving a very general answer, Dr. Halla, but uh, but I think um, the answer is yes, it is very likely that the community environment does affect. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shivani. And we have another question for you. Uh, was there any data about the employment level of the mothers in the survey that you uh, showed it? Yeah. So in fact, I think the DHS survey does, at least in the 2017 that I looked at the questionnaire, they do have employment levels. And I do know that there's been data that is showing that depending upon the kind of employment, you are likely to see a different use or pattern of um, breastfeeding and use of breast milk substitutes. Um, what we, we used was education and income. And often what happens when you use those two variables, then they become, they're very correlated with employment of the household as well as of the mother and, and, and the father. So, but yeah, it's an important question. Actually, it'll be very interesting to look at to see if it did matter, uh, the employment level did matter. Um, yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shivani. And uh, maybe we have a, a, a two couple of questions, uh, one for uh, Reem. Uh, did you face any objections from companies producing uh, such products and how we were able to deal with them uh, if we face it in the future? Dr. Reem, please. I uh, think that, that's a really good question. So there's a lot of research that tells you how to uh, kind of the lobbying technique used by these companies and what, what public health can do for them. I want to share a small, so the reason Saudi Arabia went, changed the tax structure was actually because there was a lot of complaints through the World Trade Organization back in 2017. Why are you taxing based on carbonation? It's not fair. So the response was actually probably not what the industry wanted, which was, you know what, we'll tax everything. <laughs> so it, it, I guess having really good solid scientific evidence helps you in these conversations and support um, to support taxation and push back against these lobbies efforts. Thank you. Uh, the same, thank you, uh, Dr. Reem. And another uh, uh, a question is, uh, 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 where is the taxation money going? In an assignment, I once did it for a class. I read how Mexico would use the money to fund the program that focus on the uh, obesity. So, yes, that's about this with the yeah. So, uh, a lot of uh, the, the sugar sweet beverage taxations fund have been recommended to be earmarked, meaning that they would be allocated for health or Ministry of Health. So, kind of feed directly. Currently, in Saudi Arabia, that structure does not exist. So, all taxation revenues go into the uh, the government's uh, one one pocket budget so it's it's difficult to uh, and then they they get reallocated but there is definitely research that shows once it's earmarked towards specific programs it's it's also uh, more beneficial and the acceptance of the public of it tends to be also more more beneficial uh, yes we have an yeah. yes thank you dr reem and maybe we uh, have one more question for you do you expect the overall improvements in the lifestyle and not only uh, regarding to the soft drink I mean, I hope so. I think there's a lot of uh, awareness as we go on. And I think that even there's also other research, which is also really interesting, that looks at the impact of the tax, not just from sales and consumption, but also from the awareness piece, how people are now paying attention to what kind of beverages they consume and just the amount of sugar. So I think, yes, I agree that the overall lifestyle improvement is the goal. Not even if we tax all sugar sweet beverages all over the world, we're not going to solve obesity. I think we all agree on that. But that's the first step uh, that needs kind of a multi-sectoral approach and a lot of other interventions as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Reem. We have uh, the same a question for Dr. Uh, Len. Uh, they ask to, to share the evidence regarding to the exclusive breastfeeding that it protects against the uh, fatty lover in a adolescence. Uh, this one, and maybe we have another uh, question, Dr. Uh, Lynn, that uh, regarding that you clearly say that there is a problem with women at reproductive uh, age. Uh, 
uh, having a less quality uh, diet and already with a risk factor from the public health standpoint, how have Jordanian government uh, agencies uh, responded to uh, this challenge or situation? Dr. Len, please. All right. <clears throat> well, the first question, somebody was asking about the evidence for uh, breastfeeding and that's the reference by A. N. Rindy from Australia uh, that I put in the reference list. So please see that paper. And the second question is a very good one. We, we know that worldwide, it's not just in the MENA region, we're having this problem. The question is what to do about it. And um, I'm not familiar with the other things that the Jord um, government of Jordan is doing, but perhaps I can ask Dr. Shabani to talk about the, the current research project where, where diets, where the, <laughs> women Sorry. will be um, changing their diet. Yeah, so thank you, Lynn. Um, yes, I think I want to highlight the fact that it's, um, we're doing the research, but it is the um, community and health and nutrition program called CHN that is focusing uh, both at the facility level and at the community level um, in um, uh, supporting women in making more informed choices around a better and diverse diet. And, and the program itself is focused not just on the women, but also their infants to ensure that um, that their diets as well as the feeding practices are, uh, are improved. Um, and this is being implemented um, um, in three governorates, but also across the country through different um, mass media campaigns. And I apologize to Nisreen Bitar, who is on this call, as well as Lana Khoury, if I'm misrepresenting the CHN program in any way. But that is essentially, I believe, Lynn, what you wanted me to highlight an yeah, outline. Yes, because people um, are doing things. That's right. We're not yeah, so there is a program and what's going to be very interesting, it's been a, uh, what we are going to be doing with, as JNL is work, we are working closely with CHN to assess how the program is being implemented and what are the areas, um, what are the sort of facilitators, what are the barriers, what are the challenges in being able to effect change in the diets and the health of women and children in this particular group. So. Over to you, um, Dr. Um, Hala. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shifani and Dr. Lin. Uh, I think that I have a one more question for uh, Dr. Ri. Uh, that what other strategies other than the taxes were used to change the consumption of uh, sugary uh, beverage? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so uh, there, we call we consider this a missed opportunity. So when in 2017, when we first introduced the tax, there wasn't a lot of public campaigns saying this is for your health. It was kind of introduced and then people saw it in the supermarket. So that was a missed opportunity because other countries and other studies have shown that when you combine it with a behavior change campaign or like a large campaign uh, awareness that this is for your health and uh, that, that's really helpful, then, then the kind of the impact is large. Larger and people even accept it more. So I would say we, in this context, we didn't, in 2017, we didn't have um, other behavior change strategies, but uh, it's definitely a recommendation for other countries that are considering this. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahim, Dr. Len, and Dr. Shibani for amazing uh, presentation, answer, and uh, finding. And uh, closing uh, remarks, we uh, uh, always need to uh, highlight uh, that the complementary feeding period is uh, the most important uh, or the critical period uh, of the uh, graph. And uh, also the data and the tre trends have indicated that the increase consumption of uh, breast milk uh, substitute and uh, sugary sweetened uh, beverage in uh, early uh, life. Uh, another uh, point also we uh, uh, always need to uh, uh, remember it that we still need uh, in-depth uh, dietary data to understand the dietary uh, uh, behavior or pattern among this age uh, group. Uh, another point that the maternal overweight and uh, obesity is uh, uh, significantly associated uh, or increase the susceptibility to uh, to be overweight and obese uh, in later life. Uh, also, the that the poor nutrition. Uh, 
uh, during the pregnancy also uh, maybe increase the risk uh, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and metabolic uh, syndrome and increase the risk of gestational uh, uh, diabetes mellitus and one important point that as Dr. Len mentioned that the uh, exclusive breastfeeding uh, for more than uh, six months without uh, using supplementation seems to be protective against uh, the non uh, 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 for a fatty liver among the uh, adolescents. And finally, what Dr. Reem, uh, she uh, also showed that the uh, fiscal policies are promising too regarding to a consumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverage. But at the same time, we uh, uh, future studies or, or more studies should be considered a substitution and long term uh, effects. Yes. Tabel? Yes, I think, uh, thank you so much for our uh, fabulous uh, uh, speaker and the same to our colleague from the uh, audience. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you, everybody.